414 new cases in three regions, and that leaves us at a case count of 14,568. And this is information coming to us from Dr. Uh, Patrick Kumar Abwaje this morning at the press briefing. And so good morning and welcome to COVID-19 360. Um, it's currently ongoing, but Anita is here as well. And uh, well, I guess we're not surprised that the cases still rise. Uh, not at surprised such at an all, exponential rate, but yeah. at least the, the rate at which the regions are recording the cases is reducing because now just three, three regions, regions recorded exactly. cases. But so the figure is quite high and also some new uh, guidelines and protocols have been outlined with regard to case management uh, when it comes to symptomatic and asymptomatic. So now when you are asymptomatic, you de-isolate for 14 days after initial positive test based on when the sample was taken and also when you are symptomatic, you de-isolate for 14 days after symptoms uh, onset and then plus at least three days without symptoms and so we'll be going to the ministry of information for more updates on what exactly is happening right here in ghana and when we come back there's more right here on covid 19 360. no sound sure. i think that's frozen. It frees you. I should remain in this village and, and, and grow grey hair. Oh, because you know, eh? When did it become? When did it? Where? What will begin? What will begin? Be patient, my dear. Be patient. Oh, Mama, let me just go and try. Oh, I can't continue like this. Don't worry. Come, let me go and cook you. Said eh, people are agitating the fact that they are in their private cars and they are being compelled to wear masks. I, can you define to us what is public? And I want to know how was the engagement before the police started enforcement? Because I, I believe they should know that the people in their private cars or with the family, obviously they leave home alone without a face mask. So how was the definition given to them before they started enforcement since they are now being engaged? to give the purposive uh, invitation to this whole enforcement. And I also want to find out from the Ghana Health Service how far with arrangements to improve upon the infrastructure or the facilities at Kumasi, the last time we spoke about them being overwhelmed with the case count. Thank you. Um, to provide more facilities in the exactly. shelter region. He said okay. it was going to increase the capacity to pass the people. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Let me begin from where could she... You, could you, I saw you know when your mask were coming. Yeah, I... I want to report you to the police. <laughs> Go ahead, let's hear you. I want to begin from where she ended. Um... All right, welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We apologize for that technical hitch, but when the feed is clear, we will be going back. But from the update, we've been told that 414 new cases have been reported from 25 districts, and that is three regions. And so the feed is back. Let's take it, and when we come back, there's more. I'm waiting for the lockdown. The government police will come to say, I'm waiting for the Non-custodial sentence. Yes, say them over code them. And I'm the last question. So uh, uh the concerns about MPP for Prime Minister somewhere over the weekend now. So more can say they will only observe this social distance and yeah, I put to call CB. But concerns if you say look at election course or no. 
some of these protocols on when it is solved. And the government response on these uh, issues also. Okay. Mamin, the NDL with UDN first and then the other uh, government related questions. And so, like I was mentioning earlier, we have 414 new cases reported from 25 districts. And that is three regions. The Greater Accra recording the highest with 332 cases in nine districts. The Ashanti with 55 cases in 12 districts. And the Eastern with 27 cases in three districts. So, 13 regions did not report new cases over the period under review. And then, when we look at the number of cases recorded or our case count, we now have 14,000. 568 positive cases out of 277,550 persons that have been tested. And the test positivity rate is 5.25. And so we're going back to the Ministry of Information for the press briefing. Behind sanctioning or punishment in law is for deterrent purposes. And we are better served if we comply. We are better served if we comply. Um, Sarah asked a question about public place. Public, I think, is already defined in some of our other laws. I think the Criminal Offences Act already defines public place, and so it's the same definition that was being applied. What is coming up is that there's a, the second part of the EI, uh, which is, um, I think, 1B, leaving or returning to his or her place of abode. That is what is being, in my understanding, interpreted uh, to mean, well, then whether you are in your private vehicle or not, once you are leaving or turning from your abode, that part also affects you. But that is why I'm saying that we're engaging um, with the police, give it a more purpose. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360 and this morning we're being briefed on our case count and how our cases are being managed right here in Ghana. And so out of the total number of positive cases, which now stands at 14,568, 6,819 of the cases were found through general surveillance and then 8,549 from enhanced contact tracing. Our recoveries, which had a huge jump over the weekend, now stands at 10,907. With debt, uh, an increase in 10 from 85 to now 95. Active cases now are 3,566. And so let's go back to the Ministry of Information. Candidate on an activity in the Volta region. And in the video, you see persons who are not uh, in masks at well. It ought not to be about political color or gender, or age, or geographic location. It's got to be what the law says. And so those who are seated with the power to act uh, are asked to act accordingly. So let me invite the, um, the doctors to deal with, does 75% recovery rate mean we can go to bed and forget all these cautions? Um, have we moved to provide extra facilities at Kumasi? Is it true that the Kolebu facility that was being put up has been abandoned? And do you intend to distinguish between recovered and discharged? After this, I'll take a final batch of questions and then we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with uh, do we intend to separate? No, we do not intend to separate discharge and recovery. Um, as uh, Dr. Komi mentioned, we are having a clinical recovery. So maybe the word discharge is what is causing confusion. It's a clinical recovery. If you have malaria and you are treated and you are fine, we can decide to do a test. We can also discharge you because you are symptom free. And the explanation also shows that you are not going to be infectious and we are, know that those people having discharge are not going to be sick again 
at least not for the next few, uh, the duration. We are still studying the duration of the protection you get. Currently, we don't have any reinfection. So our purpose of the, 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 the website and the dashboard we give you is to identify the number of cases that have been seen, those who have recovered, and the active cases are the people that is of concern as far as clinical management and isolation is concerned. And so we do not intend to look at that. In the follow-up, we may follow some of them up to check their clinical, I mean, by, uh, viral recovery, if you see, but that's really not going to, we are not going to separate them. They have all recovered, and for the purpose of work and social function, they are part of the society, and that's why we want to, to leave it. The Kolebu building has not been abandoned. It's going on. As you know, see, the response to this is about building our strength from the beginning was to build our capacity for the next any pandemic infectious disease that is happening. And so everything that is being done is being done properly in a more sustainable way. So nobody has abandoned the Kolebu one. It will be done. And I believe that they actually started to fill it up. I have just returned from Kumase last night to follow up on that. In the, currently, we are expanding by about 100 beds. We are expanding about seven, 14 beds in Kumase South. And by this weekend, it will be free. I've just gone there to see, to inspect, to see what needs to be done. We are giving them additional uh, prefab buildings so that staff will have a place to sleep and rest while they work. And that prefab is going there today by tomorrow. It should be there. I've also been to the Tuase to look at a 70 bed facility donated by Professor Frimpon Boatin. I've been there. The place has been cleared. All we are doing is ensuring that the catering services I managed to do there will put in additional staff as is needed. And we are hoping that within a week, that place too will be ready. So we are adding at least. 100 beds, um, one seven at um, some at uh, Kumase Suntreso, expanding the number of beds in Kumase South, and then this 70 plus beds in there to add. So we are hoping that within the next um, one week or so, this expansion will take place, and then the cases will be there. With the discharge criteria, a new question. A number of people who are waiting have been discharged, and so we are not experiencing that acute congestion that we had a week or so ago. Is Ghana safe? I will say Ghana can be made safer. And I'll say that if you look at the number of deaths, you are talking about recovery 75%. If you look at the percentage of deaths, what it means is that 99% of everybody who've got this disease, being current, looking at this current trend, will recover one way or the other, whether you were sick or you were not sick. Because the, the percentage who die is still less than 1%. Now, but this is a very disruptive disease. And so the effect on society, the effect on the community, because of isolation, et cetera, is such that it is something we can all work well to reduce. And so if you abide by the three protocols that have been given, the rate of infection will reduce, the rate of people who will die will reduce, and also the rate of disruption of care and services, both health and everything, will be reduced. So yes, by following those pro uh, pr uh, protocols, we can make Ghana safer. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. Colleagues, is there a final batch of questions, or do we leave it here? One, two, three. So we'll take the final batch of three, and then we'll leave it here. Um, Honorable. Yes, sir. Can you uh, kindly explain? introduce yourself? Yeah, to my us, name sir. is John Awuni. I represent Kesben. Hi, John. Yes, I just need some clarification about the portion of the law that talks about leaving and returning to one's place of abode. How does the 
police determine that? And can that portion be made inoperative? Thank you. Thank you. Honorable, good morning. Morning. Uh, FM JC from Accra FM. Hi, JC. Pacho, my question is, how many are just charging on our mobile phones this year? No, I say GHS phone is on mobile phones be sure. No, say be on mobile review. I na say, I say on mobile hospital na on mobile on mobile review. I'm on mobile hospital for review. Yeah. I'm on mobile hospital for review. Just like any normal patient, I'm on mobile hospital for review. Right. Into who they are going to come? Say, you're born into who they are. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Atamin Sangoro from Ghana. Hi, Atamin. Hi, Atamin. I want to find out whether. Ghana has started using rapid diagnosis test for. Okay. Yeah. Then I want to comment on the demolition of uh, uncompleted burden at the Nigerian High Commission. No, though I've heard the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has issued a statement, but I want an uh, update on this issue. Okay. My understanding was that they are commencing an investigation into it. I'm sure you follow that one. That they are commencing an investigation into it because contrary to what was initially believed that this was a government action and the speculation even by some key media persons um, essentially taking on government that why didn't government apply diplomatic measures, etc. It is turning out that I think the USU too is claiming responsibility for the action, but it is an action that affects a diplomatic, um, may I say, property. And so the state is interested because under the Vienna Convention and other things, we have a responsibility to ensure that um, such, such acts are uh, addressed in a proper legal manner. And so, as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has mentioned, uh, first of all, Ghana as a country, I think, has apologized to the Nigerian government that this has happened in the first place, but as a state is proceeding to uh, conduct a proper investigation to understand uh, the circumstances. But this is not state action, as um, we are beginning to find out. And I think it's important that we all hasten slowly when things break on the internet or on social media. We're all hasting slowly before we uh, jump to conclusions. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Kumar, one more question. Some people feel allergic to the wearing of the face mask. I, for instance, I'm for one or two hours. I get repetition and headache. And such people, what must they do? Because it is as, as estimated that you can wear for 12 hours. But some of us who are a little bit aged, it's, it's a bit of a problem. So what must we do? A case in point is myself. What do the guidelines say about persons who say they are uncomfortable or they have reactions when they wear masks? Okay. Then, uh, honorable, there was a news report this morning that government is uh, discharge of uh, PPEs to schools and other places. Some schools have gotten this, others have not gotten this. What is happening? Thank you. The distribution is ongoing. That is what is happening. The distribution is um, uh, ongoing. It is our expectation that uh, as quickly as possible, they will complete the distribution um, of all of these PPEs to the various schools across the country. Let me deal with the first question, and then I invite Dr. Abadi to deal with the IDT um, question. Um, I think the first question is captured. And that's the information Minister Honorable Kojo Pong Kuma addressing some issues that have been raised at the press brief. And earlier, we had uh, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaje also giving us updates on the case count. Now, uh, we'll go back quickly to the feed and we'll give you details about how many beds are being provided in the Ashanti region, um, of course, to support the low bed capacity. But take a look at this. Non private space, um, which means in this public space, the idea is to ensure that you are wearing a face covering for the protective purposes that I've mentioned. What is happening is this gray area about, how about if I'm leaving my home, but I'm in my private vehicle uh, to a particular place, and that's what... I think we'll leave it here this morning. We're very grateful. On Thursday morning, we'll would engage with you with the latest updates. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. The RDT, the RDT. Please take that and then we'll consider that as a wrap. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Currently, we continue testing RDTs. Officially, we are not using any RDT yet. But I'm sure as soon as FDA and finds their suitable one, 
it will be applied. But currently, we do not have. But I know there are lots of RDTs that are being tested. Um, on the mask, uh, we all have types of allergies that we, we have. There are people who wear them some and they probably sneeze or they have anything. You just have to probably change the material and make sure that you are wearing the one that works for you. That is why we are using a gray bath, which is a bit more neutral. And there's a, the amount of fluff is it's quite reduced. If you look at the government one, that's a gray bath. And so reaction is a bit less. But if you have such a big problem and because there's a law, you also know that if you know you can wear it for two hours, then make sure that you plan your outing for two hours, whilst we find uh, the most appropriate one that works for you. People have ones that they react to, but others they don't react to. I think it's up to you to also find the most appropriate material that, way, that works for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abwaji. So colleagues, as we wrap up, let me just put out a couple of announcements. One, tomorrow at 1 p.m., we are resuming the Meet the Press series, where various ministers come and give an update of what is happening in their sector. You recall that we suspended it when we went on lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. So tomorrow at 1 p.m., the minister responsible for works and housing, the Honorable Atachina, will join us uh, as we resume the Meet the Press series. But ahead of that, at 10 a.m., the Minister for Tourism will lead the launch of the Tourism Enterprise Support Program. Remember, there is some uh, stimulus or financial support that is being given to the hospitality sector, especially in these difficult times. Uh, uh, herself and her team will join us here at 10 for that launch, and then at 1, the Honorable Minister for Works and Housing will join us for the resumption of the Meet the Press series. We thank you very much for your support and your time. As the President mentioned on Sunday, please let us not relent on the public education uh, on COVID-19. Thank you very much. And yes, that's the end of today's uh, press briefing concerning COVID-19, uh, of course, 360 here on the show. We're giving you updates on that. Now, one important thing that came up was the issue about the treatment and isolation uh, facilities in the Ashanti region being overwhelmed. This was a question posed by one of our journalists here at Media General during the press briefing. You recall that last week, Tuesday and Wednesday, there had been updates about how uh, the Ashanti region did not have any more beds for uh, COVID-19 patients. Now, at that time, the Kumasi South Hospital had only 20 beds and Okonfanochi had 18 beds. And the uh, Ghana Health Service had indicated that they were going to increase the bed capacity. And also there was a doctor who was willing to give his private facility um, for treatment and for isolation as well. So this morning there was an update on that and Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaji has indicated that the Kumasi South um, Hospital is looking at receiving some 14 more beds and also they will be receiving a restroom for staff so they can um, stay in there when they're tired and need to rest. Now there's also a private facility that's providing 70 beds at that facility and also donated by a doctor. And so I believe that this is a doctor that was said to have been mentioned last week providing his private facility. That is a 70 bed facility. And also the Suntresu Government Hospital will be providing seven more beds as well. And so this is at least an update as to how many more beds that the Ashanti region will be receiving. In total, about 100 beds just to, um, you know, uh, add on to the beds that already exist in that region. There were also some updates on the use of the mask as well. One thing that has come up, and I'll have this conversation with Anita, is the fact that now the Ghana Police Service is saying that you can't be arrested and prosecuted for not wearing your masks whilst you're driving alone in your car with your glasses rolled up. This has generated, uh, you know, conversation on social media because a lot of people have the view that if I'm alone, then what's the point? in wearing my mask? Is it not just like being in my house? Because if I'm not obliged to wear my mask in my room, why when I'm alone in my car? I don't know what you think about exactly. it. Exactly, I, I had it this morning and it, it sounded very upset to me. I'm like, because I personally, I live alone. Mm -hmm. I'm in my car alone coming to work. And so when I'm getting down, then I put on my mask because I'll be getting in touch with other people. And so that directive, I think it's, it's not too good because some of us, like uh, one of the journalists asked, 
when we put the mask on for a very long time, you know, especially when the, uh, how do you call it, the elastic is a little bit too tight, mm -hmm. you get headaches and things. So in between, you have to take it off. And so that period that you're in the car, that is when you get to have a little relaxation in terms of wearing the mask. And so yeah. I think that restriction should be eased. Well, interestingly, uh, there was actually a report that indicated that the aerosols can be suspended in the air. So whether it's in your car or wherever, for about three days. Hmm. And so for, you know, just in case you uh, put out some aerosols or someone, you give someone a lift and that person leaves, you know. They, what of those of us who don't even give lifts? Eh, you never know who might jump into your car at what point. Or you see, that's the thing. What if it is your own and you inhale it back? I, it doesn't make sense. I <laughs> Everything don't understand. Everything is so complicated at yeah. this point. Yeah, but the EI-64 indicates that you should wear it. And I'm just going to try and read a bit of it before we carry on. So wearing a face coverings, EI-64-1 uh, says a person shall wear a face mask, face shield, or any other face covering that covers his or her nose and mouth completely when that person is A, in a public place, or B, leaving or returning to his or her place of abode. And so that also covers everyone else who may be driving. And even the Minister of Information said it was stipulated in the executive instrument. And so as a result, we have to adhere to it. This is going to be tough. Very tough. But well, don't find yourself on the wrong side of the law. Try as much as possible. It's, it's uncomfortable, but I guess at this point... Uh, until they come up with another explanation as to why this is happening. We might have to stick to it. Yeah. Anyway, so COVID-19, 360, I think it's time for us to break things down further. Yes. Um, Unfortunately, you. the um, Ghana Health Service dashboard on their website is yet to update the figures as we've been told. But uh, there's been um, an amendment when it comes to discharge or recovery protocols based on new evidence on transmission risks of the COVID-19 disease. And so it has been outlined uh, from the press briefing we just had. And the key highlight states that symptomatic cases, you de-isolate for 14 days after symptoms onset and plus at least three days without any symptoms. That is when you will be discharged. And when you are asymptomatic, you de-isolate for 14 days after the initial positive test and also based on when the sample was taken. And a repeat PCR test is no longer necessary uh, for de-isolation discharge and patients will be reviewed at least twice after de-isolation or discharge before they are finally discharged from care. And so that is the new update when it comes to you being discharged or you being termed as recovered when it comes to COVID-19. And so this is COVID-19 360. We're taking a break at this point. When we come back, there's more right here. Do stay. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19, 360. And now I'm about to give you the figures on the African continent and also globally. And South Africa has taken that huge jump by being the first country on the African continent to cross the 100,000 mark. And as of this morning, it is at 101,590. And when it comes to the total confirmed cases on the African continent, it is 316,150 with South Africa having 101,590 cases. And South Africa has also recorded one of the highest recoveries or the first uh, highest when it comes to recovery. That is 52.6% on the African continent. And so out of the figure, uh, they have recorded half of it or over half of it is recovered uh, or they have recovered. And let's go to Egypt. Egypt is second highest on the African continent with 56,809. And Egypt is looking forward to easing restrictions on hospitality and also the tourism sector and allowing flights and people to come in to the country for tourism purposes. But there's, there are questions on whether indeed uh, the tourism sector in Egypt will go back to what it used to be like, especially looking at the times we are in. And so we're looking forward to seeing if indeed they will be able to bounce back from next month when uh, tourism activities begin in Egypt. Now, when we go to Nigeria, they have 20,000. 919 and as of this morning all 36 states in nigeria have recorded cases with lagos state being the epicenter with over 8,000 cases when we come down here to ghana the the case count is no different as we're still recording cases and this morning over 400 cases have been recorded and our figure is 14,588 and cameroon has 12,041 cases and then algeria with 11,920. Now let's look at the recoveries, which is doing quite well with 150,400. 
and 55 recoveries on the African continent. And when it comes to recoveries on the continent, that is out of the 316,000 150 recoveries we've recorded, uh, 150,000 of it. Okay, looks like we're having just a little challenge with this. Um, but okay, it's, it's still loading. But I think at this point, uh, I'll be handing over to Bella as we engage Dr. Bertha Ai and then Dr. I. Okay, I think it's, it's back. Sometimes uh, it happens. I mean, technology, especially around this time. But uh, we can bear with our network service providers but south africa when it comes to recoveries 53,444 recoveries that is 52.6 percent of the total number of recoveries they have recorded and egypt with 15,133 ghana over 10,000 it's not over 10,000 you know like we keep mentioning over the weekend we had that huge jump and so when we go to algeria we have 8,559 now let's look at the deaths and it's only in this particular parameter that South Africa is not leading, surprisingly, because they lead almost across all the parameters. But for this particular one, Egypt is leading with 2,278 deaths, South Africa with 1,991, just some nine cases away from the 2,000 mark, and Algeria with 852 Sudan with 533 and the Nigeria with 525. And for healthcare workers who have been affected, we have 5,990, just 10 cases away from that 6,000 mark with South Africa leading with 2,084 healthcare workers who have been affected with 14 deaths, Nigeria with 812, two deaths, and in Egypt with 350 with 90 deaths. Now let's go to the Johns Hopkins Re uh, Coronavirus Resource Center and then find out how globally we are doing. And so as you can see on the dashboard, we've crossed the 9 million mark with 9,115,398. 9,115,398 and the United States is leading and they have been leading for a very long time now with 2,312,302 confirmed cases. 2,312,302 cases in the United States. And over the weekend, uh, President Donald Trump had his rally. And after the rally, it has been uh, you know, reported that six of his people who helped him put his staff together, or who are his, his workers, six of them, have tested positive for COVID-19. And this is a president who... Uh, you know, has been reported to trumpet the coronavirus pandemic has been over exaggerated, and he doesn't really believe in some of the things that have been reported. But this is what his country is looking like now. When we go to Brazil, they have one million one hundred and six thousand four hundred and seventy. And if you remember, right here in Ghana, some time during uh, you know when we started recording cases, we had some people going to. Uh, a beach, you know, and that was one of the things that got a lot of people talking. And same has happened in Brazil as Rio de Janeiro, one of the states which is recording the second highest cases in Brazil. One of their beaches, people thronged into the beach and then to have fun. And people are afraid, or most of the people who live in that state are uh, more or less afraid that there may be a surge looking at the cases that are being recorded in that particular state. And Brazil, there's been a lot of talk, especially in that uh, country. But when we go to Russia, they have 598,878 cases. And also starting from uh, today, actually, more indoor restaurants, the hospitality sector is also easing in Russia. They are looking forward to having more of the... Um, sectors that have been under lockdown and under so many restrictions being eased. And then let's go to India. India has 440,215 cases. And uh, for India, the talk of India right about now has to do with car manufacturing company Suzuki, where um, they unknowingly to a lot of people had an isolation center in their premises and so when anybody tests positive for the virus you put in that isolation center without the knowing of uh, the health ministry or the health sector and so 17 of the suzuki, uh, suzuki workers tested positive for covid 19 
but authorities were not aware of that situation and now the 17 workers are nowhere to be found and so that is the latest coming in from india and from the camp of the car manufacturing company suzuki now let's go to the united kingdom where 306,761,000 people have been affected by the novel coronavirus and like boris johnson mentioned uh, in one of his addresses he mentioned that they are looking forward to easing restrictions as well and then when it comes to the hospitality sector that particular sector uh, they are looking forward to easing it and then hotels will start working and all of that now recoveries on the global scale we're looking at four million five hundred and forty three thousand eight hundred and forty seven recoveries four million five hundred and forty three thousand eight hundred and forty seven with the United States recording 640,198 recoveries. Yes, Brazil with 601,736, making them the second highest globally. Russia with 355,847 recoveries. India with 248,190. And so most of the countries that are in the same uh, parameter when it comes to the highest on the continent are also the highest when it comes to the recoveries. Now let's look at the deaths. And U.S. is running through from highest number of cases to highest recoveries to highest number of deaths and when it comes to the global deaths the united states has 120,402 deaths and for most of the hospitals in the various states they are overwhelmed especially with the number of cases and also the deaths that are being recorded and especially in houston they are really overwhelmed when it comes to their hospitals and when we go to brazil they crossed the 50,000 mark when it comes to deaths as at yesterday. And now at 51,271 deaths, the United Kingdom with 42,731 deaths. And then Italy with 34,657. And yesterday, the global projection was at 10 million. This morning, still at 10 million. And we have crossed the 9 million mark globally when it comes to the confirmed number of coronavirus cases across 188 countries or regions. And so, Bella, this is what the global figure is looking like. Hmm. We're almost inching towards 10 million. Well, not surprising, especially because human beings are stubborn. And the more they practice, uh, they preach that we should practice social distancing and wear a nose mask, the more people... Uh, flout these directives. So anyway, speaking of nose mask, I mean, of course, the executive instrument 64 has said that we need to wear a nose mask uh, when we're on our way to or from work or wherever. So whilst you're in your car, even if you're alone, you have to wear it. Now, I just went online to check if that's the case across. And here it says that uh, according to medical experts, you really don't need to do it if you're driving solo or with your family who presumably share the same household with you. The thinking behind this is that since you interact with the same people at home where you don't wear a mask at all, the same practice should apply inside your car. That said, you should always carry a face mask and a bottle of sanitizer inside the vehicle for when you need to step out for any reason at all. Uh, we've been joined by Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi. I want to pick her thoughts on this particular issue. And so uh, we're going to try and see if, unfortunately, our connection has just gone off at that point. But we really want to understand what she thinks about this particular issue. And there she is. Dr. Betha, good morning. Okay, we can't... Oh, now we can hear you. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. All right. So first point uh, of discussion is about wearing your nose mask when you're driving alone in your car with your glasses rolled up. Now, the executive instrument 64 says that we need to um, wear it. We've heard the Ghana police also say that you can be prosecuted if you're caught without your nose mask whilst driving by yourself. Is this even applicable in the first place? Well, I think that the, the intent behind the regulation is good, but in practical terms, it's burdensome. Anytime you make a policy, you want to make sure that the execution of it is not more burdensome than you know not doing it at all in medicine we have a term called do no harm it means if you can help a patient do so if you think you're going to cause harm don't do it the fact that so many people have an outcry about it means that something needs to be done and in the u.s and around the world laws are changed all the time in fact this pandemic has shown 
we're hoping that this reconnects. Uh, still challenges, um, of course. But Dr. Bertha there giving us her thoughts on whether we should adhere to the law that says, of course, it's a law. So unfortunately, until it's changed, we won't have a choice than to adhere to it. But um, she's just breaking it down as to whether it is even our right for us to wear nose masks in our cars when we are all by ourselves. Now, basically, the argument has been that if I can go to a restaurant or any of these public places where I can get some food and I will not be arrested for taking off my mask whilst I'm having lunch or dinner or breakfast or whatever, uh, what stops, uh, what then makes it easy for the police to say that then if I'm in my car all by myself, I should, um, you know, wear my nose mask. Dr. Betha is back. Hello. Okay. Did you lose me for a moment? Yes, I'm not you. sure. I lost you. I mean, okay. I thought, yeah, you can, you can start off again. Okay. So I was saying that um, sometimes you can make a rule that is so burdensome that it becomes difficult to implement and you give rise to civil disobedience where a lot of people say, we're not going to do this. You know, mm -hmm. um, that, what is the goal? The goal of the masks is that if somebody has an infection, an asymptomatic career or an infected person, the thought is that their water droplets from their mouth and nose is filled with the virus so that if they put on the mask, it collects on the inside of the mask and we're all protected. However, if you're in your car by yourself, they, there's absolutely no reason why you should have a mask on. And unless there's only one caveat, if you share your car with multiple people, let's say it's a company car and driver A is going to pick it, and then driver B would also drive it for another three hours. You're going to pick the minister. Then I can. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we're hoping this reconnects again. This is something that we're grappling with today on the show. Pardon us um, for that. But like she said, and so if this car is being used by multiple people, then there is a clear reason why you should wear your nose mask whilst you're in there. But if you're by yourself, then maybe there's no point uh, in doing so. Uh, um, so we hope that we can land on that so we can move on to the next one. Also, a point that was raised earlier was the fact that if you shed the virus sometimes in your fecal matter, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the virus in there is active and could be infectious. And so earlier, uh, Dr. Bertha had also mentioned that there was a study that indicated that even when you're flashing the toilet after someone has used it, you need to be careful. If you can cover it, go ahead and do so uh, because you could also catch the virus from that point. I wanted to uh, give us some more explanation on that later, but she's back and so we'll wrap up on this issue concerning wearing your nose mask in the car. You were talking about sharing the car with multiple people. Yes, I mean, because we yeah. know that, like everything has to be based on science and knowledge. We know that the virus can stay suspended in the air if somebody's infected from three to eight hours. Some people even say several days, although at least the scientific data suggests more like eight hours. So then it makes perfect sense. If you share your car with people, you pick people, then you can do that. But otherwise, if you're by yourself, I, and then the other thing too is you have to be able to put it on without infecting the outside of the mask, et cetera. But I don't think it's very practical and um, it would lead to disobedience. And so, you know, it's just going to be costly. They're just going to put people in prison and um, divert from the point. The point is, look, Bella, this disease has been burdensome financially, emotionally, and so I think to add this one, it's just going to increase mental stress. Like people are going to. Huh. Okay. And again. All right. So anyway, this is COVID-19 360. We're live on TV3 and also on DSCV channel 279. And this question has been coming up. And so we're hoping that we can reconnect with Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi so she can land on this particular issue. But get at us on social media. Let us know what you think about this particular issue about wearing your masks in your cars when you are by yourself. Is it feasible or not? Dr. Betha says that this is burdensome and at this point, the last thing we want to do is to lay more burden on citizens, especially because we're still grappling with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So find us on social media at TV3 Ghana and also send us a WhatsApp message and let us know your, th your thoughts actually on this particular issue and she's back sorry about that doc, dr betha uh still a technical challenge but yeah you can carry on 
Yeah, so I was saying that already people are burdened with their finances, emotions, fear of the illness, and we do not have to add fear of being caught by the police to the list of things we're worrying about. I think it would just make people disobey. And throughout history, we know that not every law that is given out is, is, is essentially beneficial. So I think it calls for a quick drawing board and evaluation of this, this regulation. Absolutely. Now, uh, it did say that, you know, okay, well, you already have talked about sharing it with multiple people. So let's just move on. This morning, there was a bit of an update on fecal matter and how, you know, finding a virus in there does not necessarily mean that it is infectious for some asymptomatic patients. I remember there was a study that came out, or I think a report, that said that even after someone is done using the bathroom, if you're flushing the toilet, you have to be careful. Either you cover it or stay away from it because if the virus is found in the bowl, it could now infect you as well. Um, does that still stand or not? And again, uh, we've lost Dr. Betha on this one. Uh, let's see if she can give us an answer to this particular issue. And maybe we can give you some updates on that so you can also protect yourself as you move along. But just a reminder, COVID-19 is still real. We've recorded 414 new cases already as of yesterday. And that update was given this morning. And so remember, your nose mask is key every time you're stepping out. And make sure that you wash your hands with soap under running water as often as possible. Days or moments when you, you don't get access to water and uh, soap. Make sure that you carry your hand sanitizer and use that uh, as many times as possible. Your hand sanitizer should contain not less than 60% alcohol. Otherwise, then it cannot do the job that it's meant to do. So Dr. Bertha is a back. And so, yes, about the issue concerning the virus found in the fecal matter, shedding and infectivity, is that really uh, something we shouldn't bother about if it should be passed on in your fecal matter? Yeah, I think that um, it would not be practical to do anything about that. You don't control who uses the bathroom before you, um, when they flush, etc. So I think essentially people should stick with the basics before you use a toilet seat, clean it before you sit on it. Um, and hopefully it takes a while from flushing before the next person uses it. But I think that would not be a practical way of intervening in any way besides there's no proof that the flushing would actually cause the virus to settle in your airway and um, lead to um, the beginning of an infection. Okay, but if, if someone should be discharged after the 10 days, because now we're made to believe that maybe to some extent they are not infectious anymore, should these people now come back home and still isolate or can they go about their normal duties? Dr. Bertha, can you hear us? Okay, uh, we'll see if we can finally answer this one and maybe we'll have to call it a day with Dr. Bertha because we're struggling uh, with our internet. Uh, let me see if I can read some um, messages as well. Um, well, Anita would probably help us with something. Let me see if I can just cross over to this side and give some updates as well. But send your messages, let us know uh, what you think. Okay, you know what, let's do news updates at this point. Uh, hopefully when we get back, we'll have Dr. Bertha answer this finally. Welcome to news update on COVID-19 360. In Ghana, over 100 final year students of the Second D College in the Western Region were on Monday evening left stranded for close to three hours at the school's main gate. The students, most of whom had come from outside the region, were seen with their personal effects lined up at the school's entrance. When 3news.com got to the school at 8 p.m., some of the students had gathered in groups with frustration on their faces and complaining. According to the students, the security men at the main gate told them they had been instructed by the headmistress not to allow any student in after 5 p.m. Polls have opened in Malawi a year on from President Peter Mutharike's disputed election victory that was annulled nearly five months ago. Mr. Mutharike, 79, who wants a second term, is up against Lazarus Chakwira, 65, who heads an opposition coalition. Evidence of vote tampering including correction fluid on tally sheets led to judges scraping his May 2019 victory and ordering a fresh election. 
Today's vote was necessitated after courts nullified the results of the May 2019 elections. Some 6.8 million Malawians are eligible to cast ballots at more than 5,000 polling stations across the country. Malawi became the second African nation to annul a presidential election after irregularities after Kenya in 2017. The country has been bitterly divided in the run-up on Tuesday's rerun. Hong Kong reported 30 new imported COVID-19 cases on Monday, its biggest increase since early April. The city has so far managed to avoid the waves of infection seen in other large cities across the world. However, the death toll on Tuesday increased to six after a 72-year-old man died with the virus, local media say. Hong Kong has reported a total of 1,161 infections. Three Pakistani cricketers have tested positive for COVID-19 ahead of their England tour. All national players were to be tested before boarding a chartered flight to the UK later this week. The test series against England is slated to begin in July. Prime Minister Imran Khan has said that lockdown is not the solution to the coronavirus crisis in Pakistan. On Monday, Khan said, that there was no need for a strict lockdown. The lockdown has created an unprecedented situation. If provinces have consulted him, I would have not allowed the lockdown, he said. Cases have been rising in Pakistan. It has confirmed more than 180,000 infections and 3,695 deaths, according to the John Hopkins University data. In the U.S. state of Texas, the virus is said to be spreading at an unacceptable rate, with the governor warning that tougher restrictions could be needed to control it. Governor Greg Abbott told a news conference on Monday that he hoped it would be possible to protect Texans' lives whilst also protecting their livelihood, according, adding that closing down Texas again will always be the last option. The number of people being admitted to hospital with COVID-19 in Texas on a daily basis has doubled this month compared with May, the governor said. He added that he was confident that the spread will be brought under control if people wore face coverings. Meanwhile, US President Donald Trump has extended a pause on some green cards and suspended visas from other foreign workers until the end of 2020. High-skilled tech workers, non-agricultural seasonal helpers, UPAs and top executives will be affected. The White House said the move will create jobs for Americans hurting economically due to the pandemic. But critics say the White House is exploiting the coronavirus pandemic to tighten up immigration laws. And that's all we have for you for news updates on COVID-19 360. All right, so COVID-19 360, that was news update. Uh, Dr. Betha is back. Let's ask her this final question, and then we can call it a day. Dr. Betha, I was asking, for people who have been discharged after the 10 to 14 days uh, new discharge protocols, I want to find out, do they isolate? Uh, again, we've lost it. You know what? We'll take a break. Maybe we'll come back and complete this. One. All right, welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We're attempting to answer just two more questions with Dr. Bertha before we move on. So welcome back, Dr. Bertha. Now, quick one. I wanted to find out, because of the new discharge protocols, we're having people go home after 10 to 14 days without a second and third uh, negative test. And so when they go home, should they still isolate what really should we do or do we get them interacting with their family members like everybody else just by wearing a nose mask so i think the best way to answer this is okay well let's read some comments uh yeah today we're having serious challenges apologies a lot of it we're gonna see <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. let's take some messages finally Okay, and then this one says... Anita, okay. hold on and, and kindly wear your nose mask Oh, uh, before we carry on. <laughs> Sometimes I need to take it off and breathe a I little know, bit. I know, it's understandable. Hey. All right. We're we good, go right? Now. Yes, we're good. <laughs> okay, this one says, hi, Sister Bella and Madam Anita. Really? <laughs> I think the guidelines the World Health Organization has given out now prior to the discharge and review to confirm a client fully recovered. But I still have a concern in that if we don't test before discharging and the client is not fully recovered but remains asymptomatic, is he not going back to the community to infect more people before returning for a review? Okay. Hmm. Anita, okay. hold on. Just so we don't lose Dr. Betha again, let her answer this question quickly for us. Doc. Yes. So I was saying that if you look at the reason, 90% of it is based on the fact that, look, 
you don't have what it takes let's just find a way of leaving letting people leave these centers but we have some signs to document it secondly ghana has done the same thing where we looked at all the social factors and then ghana has an unpublished study of 146 people whose virus was not infectious by day 14 and so we gave that 14 day rule that if you are asymptomatic after 14 days you can be discharged if you are symptomatic let's wait for that plus three days it doesn't mean that the virus is not infectious anymore in fact if you read the who brief itself there is three distinct sentences in there which i would like to mention number one they said there is no zero risk strategy that any country can implement okay well, at least I think we got it to a certain point. Anita, we'll come back to you. Okay, this one says the police should focus on people walking around without the mask and stop meddling with people in their cars with glasses rolled up since it's the same as being alone in a room. Okay, this one from Pap Pa Kofi Beidu from Race Course Ridge Takradi says, I suggest that the government should again look into the execution of that EI on mandatory face mask because most Ghanaians are trying to adopt to the wearing of the face mask during this pandemic. And the long hours of wearing the mask per doctor's suggestions reduces the oxygen intake into our bloodstream, causing pressure, ulcers, skin irritations, etc. And he, he says his source is a team from the University of Huddersfield Institute of Skin Integrity and Infection Preventing Detail, the underlying causes and effects of face mask and provides suggestions for damage mitigation in a study published in February in the Journal of Wound Care. Okay. All right, back to Dr. Bertha. So you gave us the first point that it's, there's no absolute zero. Yes, and the second thing is that they make it very, very clear that the virus can still become, you know, can still be infectious afterwards. But to help everyone, let's just give everybody a check mark. Now, there have been studies on ships which has proven beyond any reasonable doubt that asymptomatic patients who are recovered can still transmit the virus. So I, I would say that when people are discharged, they should stay at home for at least 30 days. If I'm an employer, unless I'm in a real crunch, if you have COVID-19 and you've been discharged, stay at home for at least 30 days. So far as households are concerned, if you live in a house with people, they're probably antibody positive anyway. They just don't know it. So I don't think there should be restriction. Okay. Stay at home for 30 days. Interesting. Even mm. after you're discharged. And that's by Dr. Beth Asewa Ai. Hmm. Anita. <laughs> We're back to you. I know, right? Hmm. But this one says, please, good morning to you all. I think there's a problem with the way we handle our nose mask. Some people just uh, put it right under their chin and they touch it anyhow. And I believe that taking off of the nose mask alone is another thing. We need more education. And that is Eve from Kumasi. Good morning, Bella, and God bless you and add uh, you more. But this wearing of nose mask while driving alone in my car isn't good enough. But what about those in mass stations, okay? Uh, please, TV3, can you please help us reach the government? The final year students of uh, Damango Nursing Training School who haven't finished paying their school fees are about to be sacked back home in this difficult time, even if the remaining amount is one Ghana. Please, for fear of, okay, this is um, unknown. Okay, okay. okay. Anisha, hold on. Uh, Dr. Betha, you want to wrap up on this? <laughs> Today has been a trip. Um, yeah. yeah, my wrap up is that we should not confuse ability to discharge someone home with non-infectiousness because that's not what the WHO document says. Especially, it says assess your risk. We're giving a guideline, assess your risk, especially when you have people with diabetes, hypertension, and all those risk factors around someone who has just recently been discharged all cautions should be exercised. So let's go back to the same documents that we are referring to, and you will realize that they did not give 100% okay that says, okay, discharge the people home, and now they can mix as you should, you should take some caution. So I would, I mean, I applaud the move because it decongests the hospitals and makes. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, so that's just Dr. Bertha speaking on the issue of 
people who get discharged and whether they should still go into isolation. And she says yes for 30 days at least. So if you're an employer and you know that one of your employees uh, caught the virus, was in isolation, was undergoing treatment and has been discharged, you still need to let them stay away for at least another 30 days before they return to work. I don't know if I should wrap up at this point, but let me cross over to Anita. Maybe okay. if we get her back, we'll try and ask another question. All right. So this one says, some Ghanaians thought the ease on social gatherings is the end to the presence of COVID-19 and they refused to adhere to the protocols. Okay. Good morning. The president has passed a CI concerning wearing of nose mask, but have they sanctioned any MP and their supporters for refusal to wear nose mask after having their primaries last Saturday? We patriotic citizens want to know. Okay, Anita, so that just quickly is... hold on <laughs> one more time. <laughs> Dr. Bertha is on before we lose her. So the final question we want to ask. Now, there's a new report that indicates that uh, people who may have caught the virus are not necessarily dying from respiratory illnesses, but rather from organ failures and brain damage. Is that really true? Yes. And, and Bella, it's not like a new information. Maybe people are now paying attention right from day one in january that's what the chinese reported that there was multi-organ failure and uh, maybe because they didn't make it explicit people didn't get it but multi-organ failure means you are dying because your kidneys are failing your brain is failing your liver is failing your heart is failing so yes in COVID 19 that is the ultimate pathway for death hmm. multi-organ failure wow. it's not the life at all I mean, the lungs is one part, but a lot of people is just, your whole body is shutting down, basically. Hmm. And okay. that is where the... Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I think at this point, maybe we'll have to wrap up with Dr. Bertha, because this was also one more thing that we needed her to touch on before we let her go. And I'm sure that she could probably hear us. And so Dr. Bertha Sewai, thank you so much if you can hear us. She's an infectious disease specialist, and she's been with us from day one, educating us on the virus has a vast knowledge um about this particular virus and the pandemic as well and so thank you to you dr bertha we'll read some more messages before we carry on with the rest of the show okay i think we have just one more and this is from eric in mankasim in the central region and he is actually praying for all healthcare workers and he's asking that may allah give our health workers strength to fight against COVID 19. amen to that at this point they really need that strength and so bella Hmm. Well, absolutely. And um, so these are some messages that have come in. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you have some more, but you're done? No. no. Do you have some more? No, That's I think we're done. It. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be back uh, with some more of COVID-19 360. Welcome back to COVID-19 360. And there's an app uh, that compiles information uh, from uh, social media and everything else that concerns coronavirus, and it's called the Pen Plus uh, Byte. So it's the company's Pen Plus Bytes, and it's with, in support uh, with Star Ghana Foundation. So I actually have the executive director, Jerry Sam. He's actually the deputy director for programs to tell us more about this particular platform. And so good morning, Jerry. Good morning. All right, first of all, please educate us on this new app. Uh, as it says, it addresses the lapses in information dissemination on the virus. What does this actually mean? Okay, thank you. So the organization is a pen plus bytes. We're a civil society organization. Mm. What we have defined uh, is an info for all platform. So we basically not leaving anyone behind. And the platform is COVID-19 infogh.org. What it does is that it, it gives information to citizens about all government's interventions to um, reduce the impact, the adverse impact of the growth. Mm. Okay, and just to give you some more information about what he is saying, it says here, um, that it has a feedback system which collates people's tweets and posts on social media that uses the hashtag and other keywords on COVID-19 and government's responses to the pandemic. A poll system has been integrated to seek citizens' feedback and um, on specific government policies or interventions against the pandemic and also interacts with people who want to verify information and check for facts on the virus using WhatsApp 
and SMS. And so that's the general information about the new app. We have a few messages. I think that we'll have to hold on with this interview and probably push that to tomorrow. I don't know if we have some more messages. No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay. Okay. But I guess uh, you have been informed today on COVID-19 360. And yes, uh, we're hoping that maybe government can redefine that particular uh, part of the EI-64 that indicates that you might have to have your mask on even when you're in your car. It doesn't say that explicitly in the EI, um, you know, where that was given. But again, the police says you could be prosecuted. Let's see what happens with that. But so far, so good. Thank you so much for tuning in. Anita? Yes, my name is Anita.